It's gone again. Okay, thanks uh, and welcome. Sorry, we've got a little bit of confusion just because we're, we're missing a couple of speakers, but I think we'll just have to start without them and uh, let them join when they get here. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning for our um, workshop on equipping populations with the skills to shape and secure their digital future. The purpose of this workshop is to take stock of the activities different stakeholders in developed and developing countries are pursuing to empower populations with the skills needed for success in the digital economy. I think this is a particularly, particularly relevant issue for IGF this year. It's sort of right at the intersection of what governments, businesses, and civil society do best, which is to help adjust uh, people's, adjust skills and adjust, uh, allow people to really um, work together to function well in what we see as a, a new and burgeoning uh, technological future. This is something that my company, BT, has done quite a lot of work on in the UK. We focus very heavily on enabling teachers, for example, to teach uh, classroom subjects on computing to primary school students. Um, you'll hear a little bit about that from one of our online uh, participants, John Chippendall. I'd just like to introduce uh, our speakers on the panel with me today. Um, we have Virat Bhatia from the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, Elizabeth Arguello Maya is joining from the Government of Mexico online. As I mentioned, John Chippendall from the Barefoot Computing Project will be joining online. Edward Choi is a NetMission Youth Ambassador. And we have Kenta Mochizuki uh, from Yahoo Japan. Um, also joining us on our panel is Sharada Srinivasan from One World Connected. Um, so just, I'm gonna run you quickly through the program since we have quite a few speakers. Uh, we're just gonna have to be very conscious of time. Um, at first, we'll have some insights from the panelists. Then we'll have a breakout group discussions. Uh, we'll report back from the breakouts and, and, conclude to, and conclude with key takeaways. Then we'll have some more insights from panelists, including online, and then we'll conclude. Um, do you know if John is on the line yet, or should we move ahead? Okay. 
Okay. It looks like we have John, so we'll go to him on video. If you can just use your earpiece, uh, you should be able to hear him on audio. Yep, I think we can hear you okay, John. We are bringing you up on video now. Yep, we got you. Yes, that would be great. Thanks, John. Yeah, that's perfect, John. Thanks. And thank you to the students, too, for joining us. Indeed. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Bye. Okay, so that was a um, just a brief overview of some of the uh, results of something that we, as I said, in BT have been doing. Um, we created a program, a program called Barefoot Computing about two years ago uh, where we actually took responsibility from the government for teaching teachers how to teach the computing curriculum. So it's something that we're, that we're really invested in. We're going to shift gears now uh, slightly to Virat Bhatia um, from uh, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Virat? Thank you, Thomas. Uh, good morning. The, I'll try and represent the situation from India. Um, as you're aware, one of the most populous countries in the world. Um, digital literacy um, is a problem. Literacy itself is a big problem, and language is an issue. Um, many, many different national and sort of recognized languages, uh, a dialect that changes every 
10 or 12 kilometers um, um, and no access to foreign devices. So the digital literacy challenge in India is sort of fairly severe and sort of increased because of the uh, basic literacy but also the diversity of languages. Uh, in the middle of all this, uh, the government of India has launched uh, a very ambitious, probably one of the world's largest uh, digital literacy programs, uh, which is called the Pradhan Mantri Grameen Digital Sakshrata Abhiyan, which literally translates into Prime Minister's uh, Rural Digital um, uh, Literacy Program. It's a scheme um, that is approved by the Union Cabinet in February, and uh, it's allocated $360 uh, million dollars to bring digital literacy to 60 million Indian households by March 2019. Um, the basic program that will be taught uh, will be adoption of new methods of cashless transactions, uh, digital wallets, mobile banking, unified payment interface, unstructured supplementary services and data, and how to work with the national unique identity program. The scheme would be launched to train 250,000 already by March 2017. Uh, of the 60 million targeted, 28 million will be trained in 2018 and 30 million in 2019. Um, it's a fairly ambitious program, as you can imagine, but still a drop in the ocean uh, with the size of the population of India is concerned. Um, I think um, the, the, the pieces that will help um, get over some of the challenges that we have in terms of digital literacy and skills is going to be video. I think the video uh, is going to be a big boon, and so that will really help uh, people um, get these skills faster than they would if this was being um, given out on text um, in the form that you and I normally consume data. So there are lots of new innovations, national programs that are underway to build out this program and to make sure that um, the bottom of the pyramid, which is rural India, is now being brought up. Um, the penetration of Internet in India is still at about 350 million, which is about 25%. Uh, the mobile telephony is about a uh, billion subscribers. Uh, so we have the basic platform in place. Uh, and also, uh, the Indian education system is such that you're sort of pretty strong with STEM education. But it's the rural portion that needs real help. And so this program, which is done in collaboration with the private sector and NGOs, a real multi-stakeholder engagement is the one that uh, will hopefully deliver the results uh, in some ways by 2090s and then accelerated over 2019. Thank you. Thanks, Rat. That's a really useful um, and a good perspective from India. It's interesting to, to hear you emphasize the multi-stakeholder element of this, this at the very end. And I think um, you know, when we move to our breakout groups, that might be something interesting uh, to discuss a little bit more. Um, so next, we'll go on the line to Elizabeth Maya, if she's, if she's on. Sounds like she's here. And so again, if you can just put on your earpiece.
Thank you, that's excellent. Just a question if I can. Um, how have you gone about developing all of these education resources? Did you consult with civil society and, and businesses and how, how have you uh, sort of structured um, your fact-finding efforts uh, in that area? Right, thanks. That's really helpful, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so now I think what we're going to do is move to breakouts. We're doing this. We're actually going to do the breakouts in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the session, and then we'll come back and we'll hear from a few more speakers. Um, so what we'll do in these breakouts is I've got some uh, sort of statistical paradoxes that that I just want you to look at and consider, um, and. The question should really be sort of how do you think digital skills uh, training can work to uh, to help fix the paradox? And if the paradox was fixed, do you think um, do you think that people would benefit? Um, so I'll break you up um, if that's okay. Uh, and it looks like we're slightly uneven, but I think that should be fine. Um, if we can get Edward to maybe take the first group, which would be these guys on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and then Kenta, if you want to take sort of the first half of this middle section. Yes. Um, and then I'll take sort of the, the back half of that middle section. Um, and then Barat, if you want to take the left-hand side here. And then we'll reconvene in about a half hour and we'll just share insights from the discussion. Thanks.
social impact is a very high demand.
problem I can say is the lack of basic education. Uh, there are a lot of children who are out of school, so the level of literacy is very high. And also a lot of content is not available. We have a lot of local languages and we have nine provinces which have the predominant local languages there. So even if we had to create a content in one local language, the other the other tribes will feel neglected. So it starts with the basic human needs, such as good shelter, good education, access to clean water, because these things have not yet been met in, in the peri-urban and the compound communities. So I feel like internet literacy is taking a backbench in Zambia because there are already these existing problems that aren't being solved proactively. So like in my community, I see there are a lot of young children who are not going to school. There is some basic education provided by the government, but there's still cost of the uniforms, the books, those are not free. So there's that challenge of actual literacy.
Okay, great. So let's go ahead and um, start back up. Um, Edward, did you have somebody from your group that wants it to present? Just me? Yeah. Just you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this worksheet, we can see that in UK, uh, although there are so many people are using the tablet computer, but actually uh, just only 4% of people, uh, they want to be the engineer or the computing scientist in the future. But um, we are just discussing about uh, is it uh, always a bad thing or always a negative thing is no. Because um, we are not uh, having the all people from the UK or in a country uh, to be the scientist or to be the engineer. What we have to do is to recruit those uh, digital skills uh, on the basic and the fundamental stuff, just like how to use the C++ program, how to uh, use the software in order to uh, design a poster or in order to generate uh, their future. Um, so. On the other hand, talking about education, we don't need a university to be the uh, jobs oriented. We just want to be have a whole person development into a broader sense. It's not just about the specifically uh, engineer, but we have some about humanity uh, involved or the political uh, provoking stuff. And I think it is university is also the place that we learn how to learn but not just only about uh, to be the scientist or the engineer. But although there is some trend, but some effort to be done is to changing the ideology of the state uh, by the government, because um, um, because just only a few people like to be the uh, engineer or scientist, and actually is not healthy for the social structure. So we hope that just by the pressurized the uh, government by the civil society, and we hope that such uh, phenomenon can be improved in the later. Thank you. Um, Kenta, oh, yes. did you have somebody? Yes. <coughs> All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. So actually, you know, uh, we talked about you know uh, the uh, country uh, kind of survey, uh, uh, you know, uh, corrected you know from the uh, company's ex executives, and actually there are you know uh, uh, colleagues from uh, Egypt, uh, Japan, Italy, and UK. And uh, actually, we talked about you know some of the questions listed here. And uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, according to the first sentence, maybe it's not this here. Uh, you know, uh, companies in the 2017 survey of global executives over 90 percent identified digital transformation as important for their company's overall business strategy. So we discussed, you know, uh, what's this sentence? Whether this sentence is true or not? It, uh, you know. Uh, it seems like it reflects, you know, in each country. But still, we need to identify, or you know, more concrete, you know, meaning, or uh, you know, what kind of things they, you know, they have in mind, you know, when answering these questions. So, uh, quite, you know, uh, it's quite difficult for us to answer, you know, uh, correctly these questions. But you know, it seems like you know it reflects in our companies. But it depends on the, you know, uh, you know, either or, you know, developed countries or developing countries, and also the weather, you know, uh, you know, either in the northern part of the region or just the southern part of the region. So it depends on that, you know, uh, kind of, you know, geographical, you know, uh, implication. And the second question is uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, what the implication of these products for the society and also the young people as well. Um, actually, the uh, it's it's quite difficult, but uh, you know. Um, um, you know, one point uh, that you know, was mentioned is that how to recommend ICT devices to the uh, use or you know uh, some of the uh, vulnerabilities, in the, uh, and also that we have to you know uh, think about um, you know uh, how to educate you know children on this matter, and also that you know how to get some kind of you know, necessary ID skills to you know uh, uh, to you know how to say to do, defend from the you know products. And um, actually, you know. I got another question, uh, like how does the lack of digital skills play a role in the products and your country or region? So uh, quite hard to answer. So we're gonna, you know, we skip these questions. And uh, the 
the last two questions, uh, another one is uh, what are the consequences uh, that would stem from the paradox being solved? Uh, we listed a very simple answers. So one is inequality, uh, you know, uh, unemployment. Uh, I mean, the improvement of unemployment. Another is uh, uh, innovation and also the, you know, uh, economic growth. And uh, a final question is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the role of uh, different stakeholders. Uh, so we, we talked about, you know, uh, governments, business, civil society, and technical community. So the, um, maybe, you know, governments, you know, uh, should think, think about, you know, how to uh, support, you know, a startup or, you know, some uh, small and medium enterprises by setting some kind of uh, uh, policies or rulemaking on that. And uh, at the same time, you know, uh, businesses, you know, uh, should collaborate uh, with uh, uh, like you know uh, other you know uh, schools or institutions uh, you know, to how to say uh, improve the uh, educational system or just you know educate the student there. So so that is a kind of you know, business you know, uh, responsibility. The civil society, uh, to be honest, we you know didn't discuss you know uh, in depth, but it seems like you know uh, it's kind of. You know, business sector and also the academia and also the uh, taking com committee's responsibility to educate uh, the civil society to understand what you know we are doing uh, you know when providing some kind of services to them and the uh, technical committee as I said it's uh, very similar to the you know uh, business sector uh, mm -hmm. but still uh, you know a technical committee you know sometimes includes you know academia and such professors or teachers or some other things so that is thank you okay thanks a lot Kenta um, my group, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and, and give a summary? Oh, yes. Hello, uh, my name is, is Samar Baba. I'm the chairwoman of IEEE site uh, Tunisia section and uh, CEO of, uh, the, of a project called Tawassal. Um, okay, um, through our discussion, we discussed um, the gender in terms of um, accessibility of internet and, um, and how, how can we create a learning environment so we can um, empower women uh, by using technology. And um, the, we give some examples about that. We shared some, uh, some thoughts and, um, and we had some overviews from different countries, uh, from Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, uh, Europe, Europe, etc., and and yes, uh, I think that um, there is a big gap between um, the use of internet between men and women, and we have to um, make them aware about the importance of using technology. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like. Uh, a lot of the same sort of thoughts were shared uh, across each of the groups, um, but it's sort of at different levels, uh, uh, depending on whether you know you're talking about a developed or a developing country, and and what the remedies for some of these issues might be. Um, so we're going to jump back into presentations uh, from some of our panelists, um, and I'll pass it off to Edward. So good morning, everyone. Edward Choi here from Hong Kong, representing the Net Mission Asia. Sorry, I left off one of the groups. <laughs> Virat, uh, do you mind uh, summarizing your group's discussion? Thanks. Okay, I thought I'd done something wrong. Uh, I just, I, I just want to make sure I had, I had the most amazing group there, uh, 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 exceptionally representative of the world, the developed countries that we had: Sweden, Switzerland, China, uh, um, Afghanistan, Bolivia, India. Uh, everybody sort of you know, make up the whole world, and we have a great presenter out there from, um, um, she's uh, from she's Dutch, and she's going to present right now. Please go ahead, take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, uh, we had a very, very diverse group, and um, we had this question on the paradox between the people who have um, access to the internet and those who don't, and the paradox is then seemingly that um, those who don't have, have much more to gain from the internet. Um, we were wondering first whether this is a paradox or whether this is, uh, uh, this just makes sense. <laughs> um, 
uh, what we uh, talked about is that access can have very different uh, meanings and opportunities and um, the, the uh, interaction between access and skills is that when people have access and use, it, use the internet as a daily component of life, um, the uh, skills, they, they might be able to get skills um, either by the, through the use itself or before using it, because uh, a lack of skills can also be an obstacle to access. Um, and we discovered that, ac that access to the internet and the use of skills is very important to be really involved in society, especially from an employment ang angle. Um, but we saw that markets might not be responding to the right needs when, when thinking about interventions to improve digital skills, uh, also for employment in developing countries. Um, we were thinking about, okay, what kind of skills should be taught, and we were focusing on language quite a bit. Um, and, uh, but also because uh, language might allow everyone to unleash their intelligence, so to say, on the internet and we might all be, be benefiting from that. Uh, and also someone pointed out that, that uh, education should not be perceived as just something that to be done when you're young, but that it, is, it's, uh, it doesn't end at a certain age and it should be lifelong. Um, and maybe also very importantly, we also, because we were looking at this divide, but we thought um, uh, digital skills and awareness is needed not only for developing countries, but also in developed countries. Uh, and um, especially, for example, on issues like how, how could, can children use uh, the internet in a, in a responsible and safe way, or uh, how to be aware of uh, security risks, these kind of issues. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. And I agree your observation that that's probably not a paradox, but it does seem to make sense. So, perfect. Um, okay, now Edward, with apologies to Bharat. <laughs> Okay, again. So I'm Edward, and from Hong Kong, representing the NetMission.Asia. And actually, I would like to talk about the internet awareness of Hong Kong youth, because uh, although there are about 90% of youth are uh, having their mobile phones or uh, iPads, but actually not much people get involved in the government internet uh, internet governance stuff because um, they have no incentive and they have no awareness about this. Although they are native speaker, but they have no fundamental skills about the ICT. It's because of the curriculum of the education system, and it is not compulsory for people to learn uh, the ICT subject. And it is also no C++ program uh, taught in Hong Kong uh, for the secondary student level. So um, they have no concept about this. And I think the main skills that we should focus for youth to ensure their digital future is that we have to buy the civil society to input some ecosystem of internet governance about uh, how many stakeholders involved in our IGF or how, another soft skill like the big data analysis and to discuss how to engage those people, the youth in Hong Kong to, uh, to have uh, better uh, capacity about the internet governance issue. So uh, I would like to uh, introduce our initiative, uh, NetMission.Asia. It's actually an ambassador program supported by .Asia organization, and we hope to bring together a network of dedicated young volunteers to get devoted to promoting uh, the digital inclusion, because we do think that internet governance is a hot topic uh, through, throughout the world, but actually in Hong Kong, not much people know about this. And it is for the tertiary student. Uh, from the university or a higher institution in Hong Kong, and we will have to promoting uh, the internet governance issues such as um, uh, the digital inclusion, just like uh, the digital economy and other concepts, so that we are hoping by youth and to teach those concepts to other youth in Hong Kong. And rather than this, we have Hong Kong Youth Internet Governance Forum. It is for the secondary student, because we hope that if we don't input such uh, knowledge for those youngster, they will know incentive and it's not possible for them to suddenly go into that forum. And it is our goal to have a uh, secondary student to have a competition about the, uh, uh, how to use the internet more effectively, just a very basic level for them. And I hope that, and we hope that those experience can push the people to have more knowledge based about the internet governance issue. And that's what we have done uh, for the past two years. And actually, I think 
about apart from this, there's some cooperation of different stakeholders. So we have the Youth for Rights, uh, that is the initiative for the young people to learn about uh, many digital rights issues impacting them. And it is actually a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative. So all in all, we hope that uh, in Hong Kong, we are doing the youth lead initiative, but not about um, people from the older stage, because we think that and we believe that uh, our generation is native user of the internet. And it is a bottom-up approach to learn uh, how to get involved into internet government issue and, in, and also to, have, to enhance the capacity building for the Hong Kong young people. Thank you. Excellent, thanks. Um, Samar, do you wanna give your thoughts? Microphone. Oh yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so I, I'm gonna start uh, introducing the project that that we are work, working on. Um, like I said, uh, it's called Tawassel. The vision of um, this project is to create a thriving and connecting country, my country, Tunisia, with a new generation of change leaders capable of addressing Tunisia's challenges. And we want to do this, we want to accomplish this by investing in youth, technology and STEM as a mean of, um, uh, for empowering connection and problem solving in two, uh, in two ways. We will connect people um, technically by providing internet access and we are trying to, building, um, to build an education and social change uh, process that fosters interaction between communities. And we, do, we, we are doing this uh, to create a new community-oriented mindset where social connection and exchange atmosphere across generations are uh, key values. And just so you know, um, in Tunisia, we only have 30% of schools that are connected. So in classes, they don't use internet at all. Uh, the government now is starting uh, an initiative that goes along with the project. They are trying to, buy, uh, to, to, to start smart schools that uses technology. They, they are trying to buy tablets and, um, and computers, but for the next five years. So with our project, we are starting this, uh, and we have the support of uh, our government, and uh, with, the, with the support of IEEE2, we are making it happen. So for now, we are providing workshops about how to use internet for kids, uh, aged between 11 and 22, kids and youth. Uh, we teach them how to code uh, through Scratch, for example, for the kids, and C++, J Java, Python for the older one. We organize competitions to, to motivate them. Uh, we are providing content through our platform of Tawassel that contains information about their fields of study, videos that facilitate facilitates to understand what they are studying and so on. So we are um, trying to, uh, to raise awareness on meaningful connectivity to empower youth. So uh, that's what we are doing in Tunisia through our project Tawassel. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. It sounds like a fantastic uh, initiative and it was uh, great to hear about that. Next we'll go to Sharada from One World Connected. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, am I audible? Uh, okay. Um, my name is Sharada Srinivasan. I am a research fellow at One World Connected. It's a project that's, I think, the first empirical validation that we are doing of comprehensively every project that is trying to innovatively connect people to the internet, both on supply side and demand side. Um, and I, with respect to this session, I want to focus on the projects that we have that specifically tie to building capacity with respect to digital skills. So our overall project, we have cataloged over 740 case studies from over 153 countries, but we have done interviews with about 120 of these projects, and about a third of them are almost digital literacy or digital or have a digital literacy slash digital skills training component to them, 37 to 40 of them, I think, if I'm not wrong. 
And I wanted to say that in our work, the research that we are doing right now from the 37 odd interviews that we have conducted, we have realized that skills training seems to take two key forms. The first form of digital skills training that we catalog often happens to be basic literacy training with respect to how to use computers and uh, basic applications on computers as well as basic applications on the internet, such as email. And we noticed that there is another form of digital skills training that is often also like uh, quite predominant in our research, which is in terms of teaching specific ICT relevant skills, i.e. computer based coding skills, etc. via coding camps more often than not across the world. Uh, I want to point to two themes that are emerging, given that I have a short, uh, short period of time to talk about this. Um, we realized that there are like a lot of our case studies seem to emphasize the relevance of engaging the local communities, especially at community level projects, to understand local context and local trainers to build trust and like create an environment where learning can happen. This is especially true in instances where we are bringing the internet for the first time, where people are more often than not wary of the new technology that they are being exposed to. We realize that digital skills training and curricula in particular often benefit from having local engagement, not just from like large civil society organizations at the national level, but often local village level leaders or local village or community level participants and Training the trainers is often a skill that has, like, or it is a process that has often yielded results. And I want to point to a couple of examples. One in India, there is a program called Digital Village Squares that is led by uh, the NIIT Foundation and American Tower, uh, which tends to have learning stations installed in about 51 village squares in India, where they collaborate and coalesce with the local community to identify one trainer who can then get training from the NIIT foundation. And then that then goes and delivers the national digital literacy mission to all of the people in the village. And they found that that leads to a lot more uptake than a foreigner doing the same with, this, with a curricula that is not tailored to that particular need. In Rwanda, the Digital Opportunity Trust works on a program called Digital Ambassadors Program that is trying to, like again, train digital ambassadors ambassadors in Rwanda to go to villages and create like hubs or schools wherein they have like groups that coalesce with each other and do not just skills training but skills training for livelihood for instance if these are villages that are primarily agricultural in nature the skills training isn't really how to use word and how to use email but often how do you use your mobile phone to get access to the nearest market price or how do you use the internet to be able to sell products better online if you are like a handicrafts company. These are ways in which digital skills training, we believe, are leading to, are, are creating more impact than just training us with the tools. And these are things that, these are just a couple of examples of stories. We have a lot more at our booth. Please do drop by and hear more about our work. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Sharada. Um, Kenta. Thank you for the floor, uh, because now you have to get into the Q&A session, so very brief. Uh, actually, you know, uh, I'm going uh, to show a kind of you know, uh, very brief snapshot you know, uh, on the you know, uh, current situation in Japan. So uh, as you know, you know uh, we have a kind of you know, 120 million uh, population, but uh, in uh, two, 2050, you know, uh, our population will fall below 100 million. And at the same time, you know, uh, according to the OECD statistics, you know, uh, our labor productivity is very poor. Actually, the poorest, you know, among the G7 uh, countries. So we have to, you know, improve this, you know, uh, you know, uh, population problem and also the labor productivity problems. So now, you know, government sets a one uh, agenda uh, called Society 5.0 uh, in order to, you know, achieve a high convergence between the uh, cyberspace and the real space. And at the same time, uh, this year, uh, in June 2017. 2017, uh, the cabinet of Japan approved the um, uh, one strategy uh, called the Investments for the Future Strategy 2017, and there, uh, you know, that document is very lengthy, and uh, there are you know uh, several points to uh, you know uh, strengths in the um, you know like uh, education, IT education, and the IT human resources. So now, because of limited time, I cannot explain it here. So if you are interested, you know, I can share you know, some of the information with you. So please reach out to me after this session. And uh, finally, uh, our company also uh, taking some kind of efforts, uh, feature to the uh, government initiative. Means uh, we are, you know, uh, in. Uh, 
cooperation with the uh, Cyber University in Japan, uh, providing the kind of on-site and also the online courses uh, where students can learn uh, how to, um, you know, uh, sell some kind of products, you know, online or how, you know, how they can, you know, open the store uh, on uh, e-commerce uh, shopping. We, we have a Actually, we are a platform uh, and providing services called uh, Yahoo Shopping, uh, which is an uh, e-commerce uh, website. So the students can run how to, um, you know, uh, open the store and also the how to, you know, uh, deal with kind of a transactional parts to order from the customers. So if again, you know, living your time. So if you need some kind of information on this, uh, please reach out to me after this session. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kenta. So we have about, it's like about 10 minutes, maybe just under 10 minutes to, um, to do questions. Um, anybody have a question for any of our panelists? Sure, right up front. Just very briefly, um, I just wanted to say thank you to ICC for organizing this and to the panelists. I'm actually working on this skills policy area for the UK government. We work a lot with BT uh, and other large companies, so I'm really, I. I want to get in contact with all of you afterwards. And I, I wonder, actually, if ICC might facilitate a sort of ongoing discussion in future amongst people working on this, because I would certainly value that. Yeah, I think we'd be, we'd be happy to do that. I mean, this is, this is definitely an area that's of, of big interest to us. And um, if I can just say, I've, I found, in particular, our breakout discussion really interesting. And as Virat said, I uh, was amazed at the variety of stakeholders and some of the, some of the common threads in our discussion. So I think, you know, I at least, and I'm sure ICC would be happy to continue to facilitate the discussion. Sure. Thank you very much. Sharda, many congratulations. This is Dr. Subicha Trivedi. We've been a supporter of the study. Your insights would be tremendously helpful for policy formulation, especially when India um, and the government have been deeply invested in digital India. We found digital literacy to be one of the key pillars, both in terms of opportunities and barriers. Um, have you been able to look at some large clusters where your classifying data vis-a-vis -vis funding is concerned, the periodicity of the programs are concerned, what kind of impact you're looking at? If you could just speak more to that, I'm really fascinated. And Congratulations again, it's a fantastic initiative. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question. So with respect to digital literacy uh, training programs at large clusters, so again, we are in the process of uh, analyzing all of the data, but I'm happy to share some preliminary insights that we have from our study already. So what we realized that is that a lot of uh, programs tend to be periodic, i.e. like event-oriented, and we are trying to see if those event-oriented uh, studies can have a long impact. For instance, we, we have several studies that we saw in our 740 database that were uh, ICT for X day or ICT for girls days or ICT for like coding camps that happen every six months but aren't a sustained engagement overall. We haven't had much in terms of showing that they have like a long-term impact. However, we did realize that if you pair them with mentors that they can have after the coding camp or after their session, more often than not, these relationships tend to last. And this is, again, anecdotal, however, but because like it, uh, like it, so these case studies are varied in terms of the context in which they deploy. But I wanted to point out that those, those fo like formulations of those relationships tend to have more of an impact in the long run. With respect to uh, large programs, one of the programs that we studied in India was the Learn Easy Steps modules that were created by Intel in 2012 that no longer are like being up updated. And we felt that while the basic steps that were created uh, for by Intel for use were useful and have been used in collaboration with the National Digital Literacy Mission, a lot of like a lot of work needs to be done. We feel that it, that ties digital literacy tools in terms of how to use applications to actual outcomes. And we see that that's something that's happening in a lot of other case studies, wherein we learn not just to use Word, but how to build a resume. And we feel that those are instances wherein like, we see a lot more in terms of actual impact, i.e., when I say impact, I don't mean quantitatively rigorous, statistically significant impact, but impact in terms of I have been able to get a job by virtue of the fact that I have attended this program where I was taught how to do a resume and email it out to employers or get access to a job, job portal. So those are like two, three like takeaways that we have, i.e. that digital skills have to be tied to outcomes, not just processes. And, digital, like, and barriers often 
end up being that you're training them just in process without really looking at what the end outcome would be. Peer learning networks and out online networks that get created around digital skills often tend to last because these people look for a community, right? When they're coming online for the first time, these are people, and we look at unconnected areas. So these are people that are like constantly searching for communities that they can then like become part of. And like this becomes often a stepping stone for them to engage online for a very long term. And that's something that we think digital skills program that do well tend to do like tend to spend a specific focus to or give specific focus to. Especially true if you're trying to do gender-based initiatives, right? And we realize that that's something that has also happened, the She Will Connect initiative in Africa. Also a study that we did uh, in, in three countries in Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, wherein one of their specific components outside of in-person trainings and online trainings is to create an online peer network and an application that women can engage with each other on to be able to create like both like share opportunities, but also like have uh, opportunities opportunities to network with respect to entrepreneurs that they were training in Africa. So if that's helpful, and I'm happy to talk more later. Excellent. Any other questions in the back? Hello. Hello. Um, Esther, thank you for all the work that you're doing. I just wanted to ask about the, the cultural aspect. Uh, how do you navigate cultural constraints when it comes to dealing with um, with different cultures and what a woman can do or is not allowed to do. Uh, because I'm working with uh, a youth organization, Digital Grassroots, to reach out to local communities who are not aware of internet. And as you mentioned, there is some type of, uh, not everyone is open to new things. So how do, you, how do you address the culture, especially for gender based? Thank you. Do you want to take this one? Yeah. Uh, okay. I can just pro provide like insights from our research again. Uh, so with respect to cultural specificities, often we found that including a member of that community within your program as a champion of that program really helps. So creating local champions that can then take forward their community within already set networks really, really helps. And we have noticed that this is something that has worked not just with gender-based initiatives, but also connectivity initiatives overall like there has been uh, and I would point to like Carlos Remorino's PhD where he talks about community networks more broadly and talks about how the success of community networks often tends to like pivot around having that like one local champion that can like get that idea and socialize the idea within that community. Uh, it, we, we have one in one war too. A, a remote island called Maivo is being connected for the first time. It's an indigenous community of about 2,000 people. And the, like, the local champion in that instance was a Peace Corps volunteer who realized that these people have to travel two days to get to a nearest hospital and wanted to use telemedicine and get internet there and socialize people within that community to the internet and build capacity there. We have members from that community here at the IGF this year. We are very grateful. And what we realized when talking to them is that it, it really mattered for them to first understand the local context as it existed. So the way the internet and skills were pitched to the community was often that we are in like a community that has a high incidence of death by virtue of lack of access to medicine. If we get the internet and if I teach you how to use the internet to be able to access a doctor, would you not be using it more? And that has actually led to a hundred lives being saved over the last year uh, in that in that like a context. So culturally, I think use the current context, identify the need, and like intervene at the right level using a person that's already got trust networks or already got like a, a social like structure that they they, they 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 can socialize the idea into. I think identifying those champions might be very valuable to your work. Okay, let's just check. I think we have time for one more question. Maybe let's just check and see if we have anything online. Mm -hmm. Do you have any online questions? Um, there was one response from online. If you want, I can read it. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, just a second. Um, so, Chris Prince Udochuku Nyoku wrote, um, challenges abound in Africa and in Nigeria, my country. So many people, even among the educated and well-to-do, are lukewarm about 
or uninterested in ICT. This adds to the lot who are interested but can't make sense of content and languages of the internet and other ICTs. Um, and he also wrote, I initiated, organized, and am coordinating an e-teaching project for lecturers aimed at equipping them with requisite knowledge and skills for adopting ICTs as teaching aids to enhancing learning. Most lecturers were skeptical, seeing only the dark side of implementing technology. For example, irregular electricity supply, possible distractions some technologies may pose if students have them. There was also absence of willingness to accept change and new things and to make sacrifices to get things done, lack of commitment. This made so many of the participants not implement anything in the face of sensitization and affordable approaches to success given to them during the kickoff training. So there is the issue of skills being redundant after being acquired. Thanks. Okay, well, we'll wrap up, but I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for participating. I, I found this very interesting and useful. I think we accomplished our objective of gathering sort of a range of perspectives from developed and developing countries on digital skills and tech literacy issues. There are clearly some common threads that sort of cut across those, you know, training, the, making sure that we're able to train the trainers, uh, providing access and skills training at the same time, um, the benefits of youth, early youth engagement, um, you know, the need for basic literacy skills and also tech literacy um, and so on. But I just want to say thank you very much and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to continue this discussion soon. Thank you.